So first of all, let me start by saying thank you everybody for being here today. My name is Ken and I am an alcoholic. Moving forward into the doctor's opinion. Does anybody know why there's two doctor's opinions? First doctor's opinion starts on in the third edition, Roman numeral 23. First doctor's opinion starts on in the third edition, Roman numeral 23. Go to page XXIII. Go to page XXIII. But then you'll notice that there's a brief interlude where A interjects a few things, and then we've got a second doctor's opinion. Why do you suppose that is? Can't hear you, I'm sorry. Two doctors. Nope, only one doctor. Dr. Silkworth. Any other ideas? Ma'am? One alcoholic, no another. So he wrote the first doctor's opinion before he had seen any alcoholics getting sober, and then the second doctor's opinion later. Unfortunately, that's not it either. <laughs> the first doctor, doctor's opinion is a letter introducing the book Alcoholics Anonymous. And then we've got this brief part in the middle where, where Bill Wilson writes. That's on Roman numeral 24. That's on Roman numeral 24. Go to page XXIV, second paragraph. Page XXIV, second paragraph. And about halfway down the page, the paragraph starts, the doctor's theory that we have an allergy to alcohol interests us. As laymen, our opinion as to its soundness may, of course, mean little. But as ex-problem drinkers, we can say that this explanation makes good sense. It explains many things for which we cannot otherwise account. So what do you think he means by that statement? As laymen, it doesn't mean much. But as ex-problem drinkers, this theory, our belief in this theory of an allergy, explains other things which otherwise we couldn't account for. What does he mean by that? It explains the phenomenon of craving. It explains the phenomenon of craving. Exactly. So what Bill's telling us is that how many people may have ever experienced this? At some point in your life, somebody looked at you and said, why don't you just stop drinking? It doesn't seem to work so well for you. Or, better yet is, maybe you should just drink beer or wine, right? Lay off the hard stuff. Shouldn't you just control your drinking a little bit? Instead of having 16, try just having six, right? Lots of times in our lives as, as, as problem drinkers, we've had other people make statements to us about controlling our drinking. This idea that we have an allergy and that our desire to drink comes as a result of that allergy explains for many of us why we kept on drinking in light of all the information that told us we should stop. This idea that we have an allergy explains for us maybe even an entire pattern for us in the way that we've been living life and in the way that we drank. It's a real big deal. Many of us, for the first time, we read this and, and for the first time we find in this book an answer as to why we've been so screwed up our whole lives. Though we work out our solution on the spiritual as well as the altruistic plane, we favor hospitalization for the alcoholic who is very jittery or befogged. Until an alcoholic is removed from the immediate effects of alcohol, there's little information that's going to be exchanged that's going to work out well. But the important thing in this statement that we just read, back again in, in the doctor's opinion, is that we work out our solution on the spiritual as well as the altruistic plane. So we've got to understand what those two words mean. We talked about it briefly earlier. What's spirituality? A relationship with God. A personal relationship with God. Very good. What's religion? A set of beliefs. It's more than that. A set of beliefs, a practice of traditions. What else? A very structured practice of beliefs, right? 
somebody else. Structured set up to help you have an experience with God. Great. A structured set of beliefs designed to help you have an experience or a relationship with God. Anything else? That's pretty much it, right? Religion is, is a design that a lot of people follow together in their lives in order to establish a relationship with the divine or with a power greater than themselves or with God, however you want to look at it. So how does that differ from spirituality? It's organized. Sometimes we call it dogma. There's a series of things that we all follow that are the same. They've been laid out before us. But what we understand is that spirituality is different from religion. You can be religious and have a spiritual connection or have spirituality. How does spirituality strictly differ from religion? It's personal, exactly. So here in the bottom of page Roman numeral 24, here where they say we work out our solution on the spiritual plane, what they're telling us is that a part of the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, half the program, is what I do to have a personal relationship with a power greater than myself. Later in the book, they're going to tell us that the main purpose of this book is to introduce you to a relationship with God or with a power greater than yourself that's going to provide you with a solution to your problem. So that's the first half. The second half is the altruistic plane. So what does the word altruistic mean? Selfless. What else? It's not quite selfless. Serving others. Serving others. It's not quite serving others. What else? One at a time. Louder, please. Not quite, because you're going to get your, you're expecting something in return. When I do 12-step work, I, I know I'm going to get something. I'm going to stay sober. That's why there's an entire chapter called Working with Others, because my program, after I've gone through the first nine steps, turns on being of service to other alcoholics, right? What else does it mean? What's altruism? What's it mean to be altruistic? Charitable. Not charitable. What else? Outside, Outside of yourself. What else? Altruism. The idea of altruism is that I'm going to give of myself to somebody else and I'm not going to expect that person to do anything directly in return for what I'm doing. That's different from saying that I'm going to give to somebody without getting anything. Because I'm going to get a lot out of doing 12-step work. My whole life is actually going to depend on me doing 12-step work. In the chapter, there is a solution. He says, our very lives as ex-problem drinkers depend on our constant thought of others and how we can help meet their needs. So altruism is giving of myself to another without the expectation of that person remunerating or paying me back in any way, shape, or form. So we've got two terms, spiritual and altruistic. We work out our solution on the spiritual as well as the altruistic plane. Half the solution is being in a relationship with a power greater than myself, and the other half of the solution is looking in my life to see where I can be of service to those around me. That's the AA solution. That's the way that we try and work our way of life. So, in the doctor's opinion, skipping forward one page, Roman numeral 26. Roman numeral 26. Go to page XXVI. Page XXVI, the top of the page. the top of the page, he says, this is Dr. Silkworth speaking, he says, we believe and so suggested a few years ago that the action of alcohol in these chronic alcoholics is a manifestation of an allergy. That the phenomenon of craving is limited to this class and never occurs in the average tempered drinker. These allergic types can never safely use alcohol in any form at all. And once having formed the habit and found they cannot break it, once having lost their self-confidence, their reliance upon things human, their problems pile up on them and become astonishingly difficult to solve. Dr. Silkworth is introducing to us this idea of the allergy. What we find in Alcoholics Anonymous and what they found when they wrote this book was that alcoholics weren't drinking just because they liked it. We were drinking to overcome a compulsion that was a result of an allergy. We're going to learn more about that as we go along. Chris, you want to start reading at the bottom of the page? Men and women drink essentially. Men and women drink essentially because they like the effect produced by alcohol. The sensation is so elusive that while they admit it is injurious, they cannot, after a time, differentiate the true from the false. To them, their alcoholic life seems the only normal one. 
They are restless, irritable, and discontented. Unless they can again experience the sense of ease and comfort, which comes at once by taking a few drinks. Drinks which they see others taking with impunity. After they have succumbed to their desire again, as so many do, the phenomenon of craving develops. They pass through the well-known stages of a spree, emerging remorseful with a firm resolution not to drink again. This is repeated over and over, and unless this person can experience an entire psychic change, there is very little hope of his recovery. There's a lot of information in that paragraph. First of all, we start drinking because we like it. Everybody likes the effect, well, most people like the effect produced by alcohol. I, I can go out on a, on a limb and say that everybody in this room likes the effect produced by alcohol. The problem for us is that it's so elusive. That line between feeling great and having your life get ruined is pretty blurry. And so what happens for us is we go on drinking and drinking and drinking, thinking that there's nothing wrong and that alcohol is serving us a good purpose without ever seeing that it's destroying our lives. We can't differentiate the true from the false. We're incapable of seeing the effect that our drinking is actually having in our lives. Sometimes you'll hear people refer to that as being in a state of denial. Then he tells us, he says, the difference for the alcoholic is that we're restless, irritable, and discontent. And unless we can experience the sense of ease and comfort, which comes at once by taking a few drinks, we remain restless, irritable, and discontent. So we started off drinking because we liked it. We like the effect produced by alcohol. Then we start using it as a, a, a solution in our lives for the way that we feel. We medicate ourselves with it. Then we see the other people in our lives drinking as if there's no problem whatsoever, and we think, well, I should be able to do that. And so we go on chasing that dragon, so to speak, over and over and over again, repeating the insanity of, of the experiment of the first drink, waiting for the time when it's going to be different. So it says that the alcoholic types are drinking because of the manifestation of an allergy, and that this differentiates us from all other drinkers. Is anybody in this room allergic to anything other than alcohol? Is anybody allergic to bee stings? So what happens if you get stung by a bee? What's the first symptom after you get stung by a bee? A little lightheaded. Okay, so you just got stung. Now what's happening? Okay. Now stop right there, because lightheadedness and dizziness are kind of fun for us, right? Okay? Now what I want to happen is you can feel lightheaded and dizzy, but I don't want you to swell up like a blueberry. Not going to happen. But think about it a lot. Like really exert all your willpower on not swelling up. Can't control it. Why is that? You're allergic to bee stings. See, when you're physically allergic to something, what that means is you're going to have a physical reaction to whatever it is, no matter whether you want to or not. And so for the first time, Dr. Silkworth explains to people way back then, in the uh, mid-1930s, that the alcoholic is like a person allergic to a bee sting. And that what happens for the alcoholic is that we have an allergic reaction. Does anybody know what that allergic reaction is? It's called more. <laughs> The allergic reaction that the alcoholic has, which sets us apart from all the other types of drinkers, is that we have a craving to drink more. And so when we started off the doctor's opinion by saying that as ex-problem drinkers, this explains for us many things for which we could otherwise not account, what we're saying is that we physically react differently than other people do to alcohol, and the reaction is we have to drink more. And so if you find that you're an alcoholic, what that means is that we can never use alcohol safely in any form whatsoever, right? We just finished reading this paragraph, and then the next paragraph on Roman numeral 27, on Roman numeral 27, go to page XXVII. Page XXVII, first paragraph. It says, on the other hand, and strange as this may seem to those who do not understand, once a psychic change has occurred, the very same person who seemed doomed, who had so many problems he despaired of ever solving them, suddenly finds himself easily able to control his desire for alcohol. The only thought 
excuse me, the only effort, effort necessary being that required to follow a few simple rules. So you see that what Dr. Silkworth didn't say is that we can control the amount of liquor we're going to drink after we take the first drink. What he said is that through the psychic change, complete change in our thinking, we're able to control our desire to drink. Our control, as he puts it here, comes from a relationship with a power greater than ourselves. But for an alcoholic, once we take any alcohol whatsoever into our system, once we take the first drink, the craving takes over and we're done. We're doomed. Most of us come into AA for the first time and we think that the problem for us is like after the sixth drink. If I could just control how much I take, if I could just stop after a few, then I would be okay. That's not the solution at all. For us, the problem is the first drink. Once we take the first drink, our bodies react, the phenomenon of craving develops, the response to that is to have more. And from that point forward, we have no control. Question? Well, that's with certain allergies, right? But lots of allergies show up in lots of different ways. We had one person who said that with their allergy, they have hives. Then this lady says with her allergy, she throws up. This lady swells up like a blueberry. For us, alcoholics, our reaction is jail, treatment centers. Our reaction is more. That's our reaction. That's what happens for us as a result of, of taking any alcohol whatsoever into our bloodstream. Because it's a physical allergy. So anything you take at all is going to trigger that physical allergy. Question? Can that, be a reaction? Can that be a delayed reaction? I'm not sure. I don't know. I'm not willing, I'm, I'm not willing to try the experiment of finding out. <laughs> you did your own experimenting? <laughs> Right, so that's different than what we're talking about right now. What we're talking about, what we're talking about is the physical effect that alcohol produces for the alcoholic. And the physical effect that the alcohol, for an alcoholic, that the alcohol produces is that it sets off a physical compulsion to drink more. And that once we take alcohol into our bloodstream, and, and the way the book puts it is in any form whatsoever, that means cooked in fish, spaghetti sauce, a couple of shots of Baileys mixed into a cup of coffee, in any form whatsoever, alcohol in any form whatsoever into our bloodstream, we're liable to trigger the compulsion. That's what happens for us as alcoholics. The alcoholic, the way the book phrases it, is that the alcoholic can never use alcohol safely in any form whatsoever because it's a physical reaction. And your body doesn't know the difference between drinking it, take it in mouthwash, or eating it in food. It just doesn't know the difference. So the doctor presents us with this idea. He says that there's this physical allergy, but that if the person can have a psychic change, a complete psychic change, they're easily able to avoid temptation. So we really want to understand what this complete psychic change is all about. Comes back to the same idea that we introduced when we started talking about being a recovered alcoholic. The complete psychic change that Dr. Silkworth is telling us about and what, the, big, what the, the doctor's opinion is telling us that we need to really focus on getting is a shift in our thinking. And what the book is going to produce for us is that very result. Working the 12 steps is going to produce a complete psychic change. They'll give us a relationship with a power greater than ourselves, and they'll produce the essential psychic change that Dr. Silkworth has introduced here. It's a very simple, precise program to put into application. Skipping over to the next page, Roman numeral 28. Roman numeral 28. Go to page XXVIII, page XXVIII, second paragraph. Chris, you want to start reading at the classification? The classification of alcoholics seems most difficult and in much detail is outside the scope of this book. There are, of course, the psychopaths who are emotionally unstable. We are all familiar with this type. They are always going on the wagon for keeps. They are over remorseful and make many resolutions, but never a decision. There is the type of man who is unwilling to admit that he cannot take a drink. He plans various ways of drinking. He changes his brand or his environment. There is the type who always believes that after being entirely free from alcohol for a period of time, he can take a drink without danger. There is the manic depressive type who is, perhaps, the least understood by his friends and whom the whole chapter could be written. 
Then there are the types entirely normal in every respect except for in the effect alcohol has upon them. They are often able, intelligent, friendly people. All of these and many others have one symptom in common. They cannot start drinking without developing the phenomenon of craving. This phenomenon, as we have suggested, may be the manifestation of an allergy which differentiates these people and sets them apart as a distinct entity. It has never been, by any treatment with which we are familiar, permanently eradicated. The only relief we have to suggest is entire abstinence. You like that paragraph about these are types entirely normal in every respect, right? Able, intelligent, friendly people. Everybody likes us. That was my favorite paragraph when I started reading the book also. Then I found out I wasn't in that class. <laughs> it's kind of depressing. <laughs> so here's what we find out in the doctor's opinion. We find out that we've got an allergy. It differentiates us from all the other types of drinkers. We can have all kinds of personality types. We may be depressed, we may be great people, we may be friendly, we may be angry. Whatever the personality type is, it doesn't matter. What's the one thing that sets us apart from everybody else? The phenomenon of craving. Yeah, the allergy. We have an allergic reaction to alcohol. So at the bottom of the page he says, all these and many others have one symptom in common. They cannot start drinking without developing the phenomenon of craving. This phenomenon as we have suggested, may be the manifestation of an allergy which differentiates these people and sets them apart as a distinct entity, has never been, by any treatment with which we are familiar, permanently eradicated. The only relief we have to suggest is entire abstinence. This immediately precipitates us into a seething cauldron of debate. Much has been written pro and con, but among physicians, the general opinion seems to be that most chronic alcoholics are doomed. If you find that you've got this physical allergy, you can never drink and control your drinking. It's just not going to happen. There's nothing we can do to turn around and start drinking like normal drinkers. It just doesn't work for us. More about alcoholism, chapter 3. The top of page 30. The top of page 30. Most of us have been unwilling to admit we were real alcoholics. No person likes to think he is bodily and mentally different from his fellows. Therefore, it is not surprising that our drinking careers have been characterized by countless vain attempts to prove we could drink like other people. The idea that somehow, someday, he will control and enjoy his drinking is the great obsession of every abnormal drinker. The persistence of this illusion is astonishing. Many pursue it into the gates of insanity or death. We learned that we had to fully concede to our innermost selves that we were alcoholics. This is the first step in recovery. The delusion that we, were, we are like other people or presently may be has to be smashed. We are set out as a different class of people by the physical allergy. There's nothing we can do to control our drinking. It's just not going to happen. No matter how much we think our way out of it, we'll never be able to control how much we drink if we find that we're alcoholics. We alcoholics are men and women who have lost the ability to control our drinking. We know that no real alcoholic ever recovers control. All of us felt at times that we were regaining control, but such intervals, usually brief, were inevitably followed by still less control, which led in time to pitiful and incomprehensible demoralization. We are convinced to a man that alcoholics of our type are in the grip of a progressive illness. Over any considerable period, we get worse, never better. So even though our drinking may have highlights where it seems like it's getting better, those are always followed by worse experiences. That's part of what it means to have the progressive illness. We call the disease of alcoholism progressive because over time it always gets worse, never better. We are like men who have lost their legs they never grow new ones. Neither does there appear to be any kind of treatment which will make alcoholics of our kind like other men. We have tried every imaginable remedy. In some instances, there have been brief recovery, followed always by still worse relapse. Physicians who are familiar with alcoholism agree there is no such thing as making a normal drinker out of an alcoholic. Science may one day accomplish this, but it hasn't done so yet. 
Despite all we can say, many who are real alcoholics are, doing, are not going to believe they are in that class. By every form of self-deception and experimentation, they will try to prove themselves exceptions to the rule, therefore non-alcoholic. By how many forms? Every form. Every form. Every form. Every imaginable idea you can come up with, Millions. we'll try and use to prove that we're not alcoholic. Well, I'm not an alcoholic because I don't live under a bridge. I still have health insurance. I've still got a wife, a husband, kids, a family, a car, a house, whatever it is. Anything that you come up with as to the reason why you may not be alcoholic, <laughs> I just invite you to consider that it may be this little thing here he says about every form of self-deception possible. If anyone who is showing inability to control his drinking can do the right about face and drink like a gentleman, our hats are off to him. Heaven knows we have tried hard enough and long enough to drink like other people. Here are some of the methods we have tried. Drinking beer only, limiting the number of drinks, never drinking alone, never drinking in the morning, drinking only at home, never having it in the house, never drinking during business hours, drinking only at parties, switching from scotch to brandy, drinking only natural wines, agreeing to resign if ever drunk on the job. This is my favorite part. Taking a trip. <laughs> Not taking a trip. <laughs> Swearing off forever with or without a solemn oath. You ever do that? A couple of times. Yeah. Usually in jail in front of the toilet, right? <laughs> <laughs> taking more physical exercise. Reading inspirational books. Going to health farms and sanitariums. Accepting voluntary commitment to asylums. We could increase the list to ad infinitum. How many is infinitum? A lot. A lot. Totally. Right? So whatever reasons you may have come up with, you should write Alcoholics Anonymous and tell them they should add these in. We do not like to pronounce any individual as alcoholic, but you can quickly diagnose yourself. Step over to the nearest bar room and try some controlled drinking. Try to, try to drink and stop abruptly. Try it more than once. Often at Alcoholics Anonymous meetings, we'll hear somebody say something like, the big book says, if you're not sure that you're an alcoholic, go get drunk. Now, we just read the line, so we know the big book doesn't say, go get drunk. But it's interesting as alcoholics that when Bill Wilson says, try some controlled drinking, that we hear, go get drunk. That kind of goes, that kind of goes back to the idea that we talked about earlier about how we listen when we read things, okay? So, what do you think Bill means when he says, try some controlled drinking? Try half a drink. I saw so many people in the room grimace when I said that, that I'm gonna stick with, I'm gonna stick with the half a, half a drink at this point, okay? Yeah, that's alcohol abuse, right? <laughs> Take half a, half a drink, half a beer, half a glass of wine, whatever it is, and stop. And leave it there. And walk away from it. It's crazy, it's crazy Chris says. And don't start drinking again for a few days or a week or two. This is really what he's got in mind when he says try some controlled drinking. You see, because what Bill Wilson knows is that normal drinkers can drink half a drink and walk away and never look back at the table again and think while their friends waiting in the car for them about lying and saying they're going to use the bathroom so they can go back and finish the other half. But that alcoholics think about drinking all the time once they take the first drink. We've got this physical allergy and that's what sets us apart as a distinct entity from the rest of the people. And so what happens for us is we can't control the amount of liquor we consume after taking the first drink. It will not take long for you to decide. If you're honest with yourself about it, it may be worth a bad case of jitters if you get a full knowledge of your condition. Though there is no way of proving it, we believe that early in our drinking careers, most of us could have stopped drinking. But the difficulty is that few alcoholics have enough desire to stop while there is yet time. We have heard of a few instances where people who showed definite signs of alcoholism were able to stop for a long period because of an overpowering desire to do so. Here is one. Now notice in that paragraph that he says that few alcoholics will be able to stop because they won't have the desire to do so. Normal drinkers won't have a problem putting down drinking. It just won't be a problem for them. Normal drinkers don't sit around pondering on a regular basis whether they're actually alcoholic or not. More about alcoholism, chapter three. The top of page 30. The 
top of page 30. Most of us have been unwilling to admit we were real alcoholics. No person likes to think he is bodily and mentally different from his fellows. Therefore, it is not surprising that our drinking careers have been characterized by countless vain attempts to prove we could drink like other people. The idea that somehow, someday, he will control and enjoy his drinking is the great obsession of every abnormal drinker. The persistence of this illusion is astonishing. Many pursue it into the gates of insanity or death. We learned that we had to fully concede to our innermost selves that we were alcoholics. This is the first step in recovery. The delusion that we, were, we are like other people or presently may be has to be smashed. In order to smash the delusion that you're not alcoholic, we're going to ask each of you to answer a simple question. Are you ready to concede to your innermost self that you are powerless over alcohol? In other words, are you an alcoholic? All that is required is a simple yes or no. Now, will those who are ready to take the first step please stand? We're going to stand up and we're going to do this. I want to make... Um, I want to try to make eye contact with each person, so I'm going to do it by table, you know, table by table. And I'm going to ask the question and simply, uh, you can just answer yes or no and then be seated. And I'll ask the next person and go around the table till we've gone through the room. Now, here is our first step question. Do you concede to your innermost self that you are alcoholic? I'm going to start on my left. Yes. Okay, here? Okay, thank you. Good. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Yes. 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 Thank you. Uh, congratulations. According to the big book authors, those who've answered yes to this question have taken step one. You've now started on the path to recovery. Please give yourself a hand. We're going to move on into the chapter of the agnostic. So the conversation is going to shift of the problem that we have with struggling with our alcoholism to the problem we have struggling with a relationship with God. Now, the good news is that there's only one thing the chapter of the agnostic is asking us to do. Does anybody know what that is? Change everything, right? <laughs> no, just joking. The only thing that the chapter of the agnostic, the only thing the second step is asking us to do is to be willing. The bottom of page. 44. The bottom of page 44. If a mere code of morals or a better philosophy of life were sufficient to overcome alcoholism, many of us would have recovered long ago. But we found that such codes and philosophies did not save us, no matter how much we tried. We could wish to be moral, we could wish to be philosophically comforted. In fact, we could will these things with all our might. But the needed power wasn't there. Our human resources, as marshaled by the will, were not sufficient. They failed us utterly. What he's talking about is that a lot of us have conversations with people throughout our drinking where they say to us, why don't you just go to church, or why don't you just do this, or why don't you just do that, and, and you could just become, you know, a better person. There's even a book that somebody wrote that's sobriety for people who don't want to work the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. So it's a, a moral code that we can follow. There used to be a program called Moderators Anonymous, which is where you went in there and you just talked about drinking a little. Unfortunately, it's very sad, the person who started the program killed somebody in a drunk driving accident, and that tended to discredit the program a little bit. So what we found was that lack of power was our situation. We had no power to control our drinking. 
and just coming up with a new, improved way of thinking, that wasn't going to do it for us. A new moral code, a new philosophy on life that just wasn't enough for us. Lack of power, that was our dilemma. We had to find a power by which we could live, and it had to be a power greater than ourselves, obviously. But where and how were we to find this power? Well, that's exactly what this book is about. Its main object is to enable you to find a power greater than yourself which will solve your problem. So, that's what the whole book is about. The whole book is about introducing you to a relationship with a power greater than yourself that will solve your problem with drinking. And, as we've already discussed in brief, it's going to provide you with a way of living which works in rough going, a way of life which really works. When I first got sober, they referred to it back in, in Clearwater where I got sober as a way of life second to none. That's what's available through Alcoholics Anonymous, a way of life second to none. We've got to get down to the brass tacks of how we go about doing that. Skipping down to the bottom of page 45, we know how he feels. Bottom of page 45. We know how he feels. We have shared this honest doubt and prejudice. So to somebody who comes into AA and struggles with believing in God, which is most of us, they're not alone. You're not unique. So if anybody in here has got any issues that prevent them from forming a relationship with power greater than yourself, you can relax. You're among friends. Everybody in AA has struggled with these questions, or most people in AA have struggled, have struggled with these questions. And we've got a simple and easy answer for them. Some of us have been violently anti-religious. To others, the word God brought up a particular idea of him with which someone had tried to impress them during childhood. Perhaps we reject this particular conception because it seemed inadequate. With that rejection, we imagine we had abandoned the God idea entirely. We were bothered with the thought that faith and dependence upon a power beyond ourselves was somewhat weak, even cowardly. We look upon this world of warring individuals, warring theological systems, and inexplicable calamity with deep skepticism. We looked askance at many individuals who claimed to be godly. How could a supreme being have anything to do with it all? And who could comprehend a supreme being anyhow? Yet in other moments we found ourselves thinking when enchanted by a starlit night, who then made all this? There was a feeling of awe and wonder, but it was fleeting and soon lost. A lot of us really wrestle with this question. We're like, first of all, look at how screwed up the world is. Look at the wars, look at all the things that people create, all the, all the catastrophe. If there was a God, God sure wouldn't design a world like this one. Or we think, well, maybe there is a God, but how can anybody comprehend a supreme being? If I'm finite, and if I'm constrained in my physical body and, and through these mental processes, I can only comprehend certain things that are finite, how can I even begin to dwell on this idea of a supreme being, of a higher power who's going to relieve all of my troubles and, and release me from the bondage of alcoholism? Much to our relief. Much to our relief, we discovered we did not need to consider another's conception of God. Our own conception, however inadequate, was sufficient to make the approach and to affect a contact with him. As soon as we admitted the possible existence of a creative intelligence, a spirit of the universe underlying the totality of things, we began to be possessed of a new sense of power and direction, provided we took other simple steps. So what that means is that the only thing we need to work the second step is willingness. That's it. And then it says, provided we took other simple steps. We follow up this beginning of willingness by working steps three through nine. And we're introduced to a relationship with a power greater than ourselves. That's the way it works for us. And then, Steps 10, 11, and 12 are the maintenance steps that we continue to put in practice to develop or enhance this relationship that we embark on upon step three. So all it takes is willingness. All it takes is willingness. Skipping over to page 47, he Go to page 47, top of the page, page 47. When therefore we speak to you of God, we mean your own conception of God. 
This applies too to other spiritual expressions you find in this book. Don't let any prejudice you may have against spiritual terms deter, deter you from honestly asking yourself what they mean to you. At the start, this was all we needed to commence spiritual growth, to affect first conscious relation with God as we understood him. Skipping down to the middle of the page, he says, we needed to ask ourselves but one short question. Do I now believe or am I even willing to believe that there is a power greater than myself? Do I now believe or am I even willing to believe that there is a power greater than myself? As soon as a man can say that he does, does believe or is willing to believe, we emphatically assure him that he's on his way. It's been repeatedly proven among us that upon this simple cornerstone, a wonderfully effective spiritual structure can be built. That's all the second step is asking you to do, is become willing. If anybody struggles with understanding a relationship with God, this is the starting point. The starting point is a willingness. And when he tells us in the previous paragraph, when he says that all we have to do is let go of our prejudice, that also means that we have to let go of other concepts that we may have. We may not really struggle in a relationship with God. We may think we know God just fine. The problem for us is that knowing God just fine hasn't worked up until now. Something's missing. So what Bill is asking us to do here in the second step is just to temporarily suspend whatever we already think we know or believe about God to work through steps three through nine and in that process God will show up in our lives. We'll have a new and revolutionary understanding of relationship with God that wasn't available to us before prior to step three. What the big book tells us to do is give up anything we know about God up until this point that's in our way. So what the big book is suggesting to us is consider your own conception of God. We don't have to have understanding. That understanding will come as a result of working the rest of the steps. That what we have to have is a willingness to have God enter our lives. And that's all it takes. All it takes is a willingness to allow God to enter your life. If you're doing 12-step work with somebody and they're struggling even just with, ha with having a willingness, then what you can ask them is, are they willing to believe that you believe in something? Because if you're willing to believe in the least bit, then you can make a beginning. That's what we just read, right? All it requires is the minimal amount of willingness. It says, we needed to ask ourselves but one short question. Do I now believe, or am I even willing to believe, that there is a power greater than myself? That's all it takes. Everything else will be presented to you through the rest of the 12 steps. That's all the second step takes. So when we talk about the first and the second step nearing, merely being concepts that we need to come into an understanding with, that's what we're saying. Everything else is going to take place. The introduction, the relationship with the power greater than yourself is going to occur through working the rest of the 12 steps. The place that we struggle with is that the minute we embark on the process, all of a sudden some thought's going to come in with going, oh, this is stupid. Or no, it doesn't work like that. Well, that's prejudice coming up again, prejudgment. Prejudice from the past, some issue from the past coming into our, into our present and overshadowing what our future can be. So just remain willing as we work through the rest of the steps to have God show up in your life however God sees fit. And it'll work out. It works for everybody. Now we find the directions for taking the second step in the second paragraph back on page 47, all the way back to 47, second paragraph. Second paragraph on page 47. It says, we need to ask ourselves but one short question. Do I now believe, or am I even willing to believe, that there is a power greater than myself? As soon as a man can say that he does believe, or is willing to believe, we emphatically assure him that he is on his way. It has been repeatedly proven among us that upon this simple cornerstone, a wonderful, effective spiritual structure can be built. Okay, let's see who's ready to proceed. Will those who are willing to take step two please stand? Again, I'm going to make eye contact with you and go around the room. Here is our second step question. Do you now believe, or are you even willing to believe, that there is a power greater than ourselves? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely.
I'm <laughs> trying to get you. Absolutely. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Now, according to the big book authors, those who answered yes to this question have taken step two. How about giving your neighbor a hand?